Welcome to the International Express to Book Central. Departing now. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. Hi there! Thank you for joining me today on the Train to Book Central. I'm your host, Jules. Each week, while we travel along on this train, we will discuss a book or a short story or maybe a poem, and most definitely some medieval literature. I'll tell you something of the plot and then discuss some of my favorite aspects of whatever it is we just read. These episodes will, of course, contain heavy spoilers as well as shock horror gasp, context and subtext, so be warned. Did you read Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar and were fascinated by its style and theme? Are you interested in mental health and the ways in which it was treated? Or would you like to hear something about a fascinating woman who turned her own difficult experiences into something to educate and help others with? Well, then I've got the book for you. This week... A book took me to 1940s America, specifically to a mental health asylum in 1940s America. The book that accomplished this feat is The Snake Pit by Mary Jane Ward. It was first published in 1946 and has recently been reprinted by Library of America, whose edition I read. The Snake Pit is the story of Virginia Cunningham, who, when the novel starts, isn't entirely sure where she is and why. When it becomes clear to her that she is in a mental health asylum, her journey towards, hopefully, sanity in the outside world begins. Before we fully get into it, I want to give you another quick warning. This book engages with some difficult themes, specifically mental illness and the rather forceful ways in which it was treated in asylums in the 20th century. While, again, I will do my best to engage with these themes and depictions in a mindful and careful way, it may still be difficult for some of you to engage with. While last week we had mentions of suicidal ideation, which were rather oblique, these are much more explicit. Your health and happiness are more important to me than a view, like, or download, so if you think this book may not be for you, do join us for another one next week. But I do want to mention that the discussions in this book are explicitly meant to evoke understanding, so if you think you might be interested, I would still recommend giving it a try. Let's get into the snake pit. Here's how we begin. Do you hear voices? he asked. You think I'm dead? Of course, she said. I hear yours. It was hard to keep on being civil. She was tired, and he had been asking questions such a long time, days and days of incredibly naive questions. Now he was explaining that she misunderstood. He did not mean real voices. Fantastic. He was speaking, he said, of voices that were not real, and yet they were voices he expected her to hear. He seemed determined that she should hear them. He was something of a pest, this man, but she could think of no decent way to get rid of him. You could tell he meant well, and so you tried to play the game with him, as if with a fanciful child. When the snake pit opens, Virginia finds herself confronted by a man asking her if she hears voices. A rather silly question, if you ask her. When he turns into a girl, she's had quite enough of this nonsense and sets to figuring out where she is. She seems to be in a park, but which one? Is it in Chicago or New York? And where are her glasses? Or her pocketbook? It turns out the girl is named Sarah and that she's not the man at all, and she gently guides Virginia inside. Inside, there is a broad room and a strange smell, as well as weird dining arrangements. Apparently, Virginia has an assigned seat here, but her neighbours are definitely characters. But they seem harmless overall. Maybe she's in a prison, doing research for her next novel. When she receives medication at night and sees that she has a number pinned on her nightdress, she becomes aware that she is not here for a visit. Wherever she is, she is here for real. The next morning, she is told to skip breakfast and is brought to a small room. Is she having a surgery? Without quite finding the words for it, she knows now where she is. 
She is in an asylum, and she is about to get an electric shock. She is almost glad for the oblivion the shock brings, because her reality feels unbearable. Virginia slowly makes some progress, remembering the way to places and enjoying a picnic with her husband Robert, who visits her faithfully every time he is allowed. He believes she will soon be out, and he has utter faith in her. Virginia is, in fact, improving significantly, because she gets moved from Ward 3 to Ward 1, which is usually the patient's last stop before freedom. She tries to find her friend Sarah, who was moved here shortly after the beginning of the novel, but she's nowhere to be found. Maybe she got out. Things are technically better in Ward 1 than Ward 3, but the head nurse is a difficult woman to please, and she seems to have something against Virginia specifically, especially her inability to work with the mops. Virginia decides this isn't helping her, and requests a transfer from her doctor. He's actually kind of impressed by this, as it shows her self-awareness, and he approves her request. In her new ward, Ward 5, a much kinder place, Virginia seems to continue to improve, and she's sent to an exit interview, which should lead to her being released. But when she comes back to herself, she is in Ward 8, and has lost weeks of time. How did she get there? The women here are a little wilder than she has been used to, and the work expected of her is too much for her to cope with. She makes very small steps towards progress, despite the weird man coming up to her telling her she bit him. Who does he think she is? When Robert visits again, it turns out this man was actually part of her exit interview, and that she did indeed bite him when he shook a finger in her face. Despite this setback, Virginia does her best to be, at the very least, in control of herself, or pretend to be. When she locks herself in a bathroom demanding to see her husband, however, the novel moves into one of the most affecting passages of its entire story. Caught and restrained, Virginia enters a fairy tale like dream state. She's locked in a tower, guarded by two mysterious men, and Robert is on his way, risking the stormy sea to approach her remote tower. Her imagination is a safe haven, as she endures being put in baths for hours, wrapped and restrained in cold wet sheets overnight, and force-fed through tubes. She leaves this dream state behind eventually, her mind only rallying back to a sense of reality slowly. She is now moved to what she dubs the Snake Pit, thereby giving the novel its title. It is a place for what seems to be the lost causes. Women who spend all day talking to figments of their imagination, or worse. The patients of this final ward even include a woman who was once a nurse there. The women have nothing, not enough beds, not enough food, and they have to rush through damp and cold corridors to the dining room to scrounge down what is available. During one of these runs, Virginia meets Sarah again. Sarah is in a restraint jacket and non-responsive except for her angry eyes glaring at Virginia. This is rock bottom, and it is the turning point for Virginia. She knows this isn't where she should be, that the outside world, with all its own oddities and terrors, is probably the best place for her. And so Virginia begins to once again take small and careful steps towards recovery, but this time with the conviction that she'll make it. Despite the deprivations around her, she manages to re-establish something of her sense of self. She's allowed to work in the kitchens and even attends a ball with the other patients. While she finds that even the idea of being outside again, of having to navigate the normal world, scares her a bit, she is ready to go home. She attends another exit interview, this one a lot simpler, as if they're hoping to get rid of her. There isn't enough reason or money to keep her, and so Robert arrives to take her home. And that is the story of the snake pit, although of course its pits are much deeper than I could tell. But those details, I guess, you'll just have to read for yourself. Now, I'd like to mention a few things that really intrigued me about this book. The first is the writing style. Throughout the novel, Mary Jane Ward's writing slips back and forth between first, second, and third person narration. Sometimes she speaks of her or Virginia. Sometimes it seems to address Virginia directly, using you. And at other times, it is the I or me who tells us this story. 
These changes in point of view happen within a paragraph and can be a little disorienting at the beginning. For example, when she's figuring out where she is, we are told, All along she had known where she was, but she had invented a setting that was easier to endure. Anything else would have been easier to bear, anything but what it was. I knew, I knew, but I tried to close the door on my knowing. That disorientation is the point, I think. Virginia has lost her sense of self, her connection to her own life, and her grip on time. She doesn't really know who she is, what she's doing, and what her next steps are. The changes in point of view bring out Virginia's fractured sense of self in a way that I don't think any other stylistic tool could achieve. It is a masterstroke of writing, in my opinion, and I'd love to see this in more books. Another thing about the writing is that it is funny, in a way that feels almost wrong at times because of the topic. Virginia is incredibly funny, coming up with the weirdest asides or jokes or ways of describing what's going on. I genuinely laughed out loud at moments in this book. And this is absolutely done on purpose by Mary Jane Ward. She wants you to laugh with Virginia, to appreciate her keen insight and sense of humour. It is about laughing with these women, and thereby understanding them, and not about laughing at them. In fact, when a film adaptation was made of this novel, starring Olivia de Havilland, Mary Jane Ward demanded more humour, and actually forced some of her own jokes back into the script. The humour shows that while Virginia absolutely is struggling, she is still there. That smart and slightly sassy part of her personality is also helping her to survive. Through the humour, you as the reader connect with Virginia on a much more intimate level, and it also soothes part of the sting that comes from the more difficult scenes. For example, in the first chapter, while still utterly unsure of where she is, Virginia gets an electric shock treatment. Thinking she might be in prison, about to get executed, Virginia wonders, If I say I demand a lawyer, they have to do something. It has to do with habeas corpus something in the constitution. But they and their smooth talk, they intend to make a corpus of me. They and their good mornings and how are you. The brilliant writing also works to emphasize the underlying themes in the book. A major message which rings throughout the novel is the shocking lack of funding and the state of healthcare. The asylum or hospital at which she finds herself is consistently running out of things whether it is clothes, toilet paper, or beds. It is especially bad at the wards with the higher numbers, meaning those housing more serious patients. Mary Jane Ward strikes a good balance, I think, between depicting the squalor and the dirt without making a sensation out of it. The descriptions are not meant to make you look down on the patients for their circumstances, but rather are meant to make you question why human beings are being treated this way. Mary Jane Ward also tries to stay away from the cliché of the evil nurse. Yes, the nurse from Ward 1, for example, is a pain, and she's unnecessarily strict and condescending, but she is still a human being. All other nurses are shown as women trying to do their best with the limited means they have. Virginia has very interesting conversations and experiences with them, for example, which bring this forward but nothing makes it clearer than the sad case of the nurse who is now a patient. In her delusions, this patient is still checking up on the others, taking their measurements and worrying about their limited means. The hardship of many of the treatments Virginia receives is also highlighted. The first thing we and Virginia are hit with is the electric shock treatment. While it is not described actively, the lead-up to it is. And while the humour, as I mentioned previously, alleviates some of the tension, it is nonetheless a heartbreaking moment because Virginia is utterly helpless. Electric shock therapy, also known as electroconvulsive therapy, induces a generalised seizure in the patient, which is meant to assist in managing mental disorders. It was first introduced in 1934 by Ladislas Maduna, and during the 40s, these shocks were usually given without anaesthetics, which would also lead to physical convulsions. Negative depictions of electric shock therapy, alongside the rise of antidepressants, means that the use of electric shock therapy has declined. 
It is still used today, however, in the treatment of otherwise treatment-resistant illnesses, meaning illnesses that are non-responsive to medication, such as major depressive disorders, mania, and catatonia. Another treatment Virginia experiences is hydrotherapy, sometimes also known as the water cure. Nowadays, this is part of alternative medicine, meant to combat pain and assist in occupational or physical therapy. During the 19th and 20th centuries, however, it was used in the treatment of mental illness, which saw patients restrained in baths for hours at a time, as well as wrapped tightly in wet cold wraps throughout the night, which restricted their movement. The way Virginia describes it, it is the very opposite of a good and helpful thing, and it is what leads her to disassociate the most. Constantly wet and cold, all Virginia wants is to curl up in a dry and warm bed at home. Hydrotherapy is, as far as I'm aware, no longer used this way in the treatment of mental illness. Finally, during her experiences with the water cure, Virginia begins to refuse food. When she becomes dangerously underweight, the nurses begin to force-feed her through tubes shoved down her throat. Countless of reports exist, from the first suffragettes to IRA prisoners and more, of people who were force-fed this way, and they describe it as a horrible, painful, humiliating, and disembodying experience. It is the same for Virginia. This is a difficult one for me in a way, since by force-feeding her the nurses are keeping her alive, and yet they're also violating her. Another thing that makes an appearance is psychotherapy, as Virginia apparently has had extensive conversations with her therapist, but she doesn't remember these, and the conclusions he draws based on these conversations don't really resonate with Virginia's sense of herself. What comes through strongly throughout the snake pit, alongside the fact that the hospital is understaffed and underfunded, is that its methods are often harsher and crueler than they need to be. Without a proper support structure and good care, these treatments run the danger of doing more damage than good. Another topic which was very important to Mary Jane Ward, and which comes through strongly in the novel, is her political consciousness. Next to commenting on the economic hardships of many patients as well as the state of the hospital, she also lays bare racism and segregation within the institution. In a very specific scene, Shortly after one of her mental setbacks, Virginia offers her hat to another patient, who is black, so that she can have something nice to wear on her rare outings. A nurse refuses to allow this and considers it improper. Without being overly explicit, the scene underlines the way in which even this experience, being committed to a mental health asylum, is differentiated through the lens of race. The diverging experiences of healthcare along the lines of race are also discussed very extensively by Audrey Claire Farley in her non-fiction books The Unfit Heiress and Girls and Their Monsters, which I would wholeheartedly recommend. They are not easy reads by any means, but they provide a fascinating background based on extensive research to the story depicted in The Snake Pit. This also brings us directly to discussing some of the context of this novel. What makes the Library of America edition so brilliant is that it also contains an afterword, written by Mary Jane Ward's cousin, and some of Ward's own letters. What the afterword explains is the way in which the novel was both inspired by Mary Jane Ward's life, and how the writing of the novel also influenced the rest of her life. Upon its publication, The Snake Pit was initially labelled as pure fiction. Ward initially denied that it was based on her experiences, but eventually felt that it was important for audiences to know it was based upon reality. People still had a somewhat rosy view, perhaps, of mental health asylums, imagining them as places where people got to rest and do nothing, all while housed and fed well. Readers didn't initially believe the way the book depicted the reality of being in a place like that. Ward also wanted to work against the stigma and shame associated with mental illness, and so it became known that the snake pit was based on her own experiences, even if many details and names were changed. After the publication of the novel, Mary Jane Ward became something of a figurehead for the campaign of improved mental health care. She was invited to countless of hospitals and asylums, and frequently asked to tour them independently, and then recommend changes. Her recommendations always included the request to provide better food, increase hygiene, and allow patients more time outside. 
This engagement did weigh upon Mary Jane Ward, though, and she ended up being hospitalised three more times after the novel's publication. A final note here on Ward's own experiences with mental illness. She doesn't put a label, per se, onto Virginia's illness in the novel, but of course she herself did receive one during her stay at the hospital. Now, it's not my place to make any assumptions about her health, so I can only go based off of what I found during my research. Apparently, in a case study published in 1943, her therapist diagnosed her with catatonic schizophrenia. During its onset, she would waver between being in a stupor and becoming aggressive, and frequently suffered from insomnia and anxiety in the lead-up to an episode. In The Snake Pit, it is not really clear what Virginia Cunningham is actually suffering from. Is it a breakdown? Is it schizophrenia? Is it depression? Is it long-hidden guilt over something in her past? What is clear, however, is that whatever is going on should not affect how she is treated as a human being. It should not cause her or the other patients to be mistreated or looked down upon. And that really is the message of the novel, and it's also the message I want to leave you with. And that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.